following program was provided by an independent producer solely responsible for its content. The opinions expressed do not necessarily represent the views of this station, its staff, board of directors, or underwriters. Don't adjust your screen. There is nothing wrong. You are about to enter a world where the very concept of time is rendered obsolete by the sheer power of entertainment. You're about to enter the Bogus Hour. Welcome to this episode of the Bogus Hour. Very excited to have my guest. He's been on Last Comic Standing, Conan O'Brien Show, David Letterman. He's got his own Netflix special called Small, Dork, and Handsome. He's a comedian. He's a human. His name is Mike Kaplan. So here I am with comedian, human, Mike Kaplan. How are you? Uh, great. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, glad to have you here. So I want to just talk to you about stand-up comedy and how you made a living at it and how you got to become a comedian? Uh, those are all secrets. <laughs> well, you're going to have to divulge something, all right? All right, you got me. <laughs> this gotcha journalism. <laughs> so uh, we'll start out with when you first started to become a comedian. You were going to school, you were a student yes. down in Boston. Yep. Originally from New Jersey? Yeah, I grew up in New Jersey. And you went to school at Brandeis? Brandeis first, then uh, BU for grad school. And towards the end of my uh, undergrad career, I thought about, that's when I started applying to grad schools because I didn't know what I would do or wanted to do. I'm like, should I be a teacher, a counselor? I had, you know, a, a philosophy major, a psychology major, all kinds of very useful practical things. <laughs> uh, I was like, I could really examine uh, what I wasn't uh, doing as far as the job was going. But uh, I, so I applied to these grad schools because my dream was to be a musician at the time. I, I played the guitar. I taught, taught myself in high school. My parents have been music teachers. Uh, I played the violin since I was very young. So yeah. I've been doing music my whole life, and I'd started writing songs, and, you know, my friends liked them, and I played them at, you know, coffee shops and uh, my summer camp, like, talent shows. And uh, I was now, you know, I turned 21 uh, in the year 2000, I think, yeah. uh, maybe, oh, 99. And, Get it uh, right. Yeah, oh yeah, but you know, it's, uh, I'm some age, and <laughs> some ageless character, uh, <laughs> but I remember, uh, you know, that was, I turned 21 so I could get into bars and places that uh, now I'm like, okay, now I can really make this, uh, this performing career work, and so I just looked up as many places as I could, uh, like clubs for performing, and one of them turned out to be the comedy studio, ah. and I called them up and they said, sure, you can, uh, you can come here and do some Give five to seven minutes. <laughs> uh, and that was Rick Jenkins. That's a Rick Jenkins impression. Uh, yeah, hey, sort of, sort of uh, my Rick Jenkins and Kermit the Frog. It's like, Jenkins the Frog here, you know? Uh, but, uh, All purpose. Oh, yeah, it works. I, don't, I have a very limited range of voices. So when <laughs> and the Rick them, Jenkins, Kermit the Frog when is When they one can of apply them. To both, in both directions, I really appreciate it. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, so he, he let me on, you know, like, every once in a while, because I wasn't really pursuing comedy at the time. So he, you know, obviously reserved most of his stage time for... Uh, people pursuing comedy, <laughs> comedians, as you might call them. Uh, as it would be. But And so by, like, 2002 is when I sort of fully realized that I was like, I do like performing, not, I mean, you know, not just at this comedy club, but I realized there were others, you know, open mics, like at Dick Doherty's uh, The Vault and The Emerald Isle and right. you know, The Green Dragon. You know, so, so I started, I was like, I, and I, like, I enjoyed the part of performing that uh, was talking in between the songs, or as some might call it, uh, Jokes. Joke. You started out with the music, and that was because that was something that you and your family were trained in. And Pretty much. Taught. I mean, yeah, it was sort of like, it was as much of a religion, you know, the way that I think, I, like, I also, I was bar mitzvahed, but that was like not as big a deal to my mom as that I would play, you know, so many people, I feel like, have the reverse, you know, they'd be like, well, you're going to believe what we believe, you're going to go to the building that we go to right. every day every day of the week, you know, or one week, one day of the week, 
Uh, I, don't, I don't know how religion works. You know, right. one, one, once a week, uh, one, <laughs> once, one week a year, I'm not sure. Uh, but for my mom, it, uh, it was very important that, that I had this music, uh, you know, in my, like, as a language in my brain, in my life. And I hated it for a while. But uh, when I started teaching, uh, when I started teaching myself guitar, and I didn't have to, like, I didn't have to go to, I had to go to violin lessons. I didn't have to teach myself guitar, so it was much more fun. When I was like, oh, this is this is great, like the knowledge that was already in my brain that I couldn't help from being there because my mom had made me take all these classes and lessons and uh, summer programs and weekend programs. Like it was, every, it was every, every Saturday I went to like a violin school for most of my childhood, and so yeah, that's what I thought. so music got. Uh, I, I became music, and that then eventually, when I was able to, here's a, a quote that I like of uh, a guy named Khalil Gibran. Oh, sure. Uh, it's, uh, the greater that sorrow carves into your being, the more joy you can contain. Oh. So, like, the, vi- the, the forced, strict violin lessons carved this deep groove of, you know, potential sorrow and suffering at a time, you know, throw tantrums as a child, like not want to do it, hated doing it, but then eventually left me with this, you know, big groove of knowledge that would allow me to uh, fill it with, you know, the kind of music that I enjoyed doing, like playing the kind of songs that I liked and writing music and uh, just, you know, being my own creative uh being and uh, being my own being, the Mike being Kaplan story. Your own being. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so that's that's how I started doing that, and it just you know I feel like most musicians when you know you see a musician perform like a at least like a singer songwriter a solo artist in between their songs they'll be like so here's a little something you know uh, uh, today and like the stakes are a little bit maybe lower for you know for comedy because like oh it doesn't even matter this guy get, get to the get to the music right. Uh, so when I do that, you know, when I perform at either a music venue or or the the comedy studio or a comedy venue with the guitar, uh, it was you know it was like a useful, uh, some would say a crutch and a, a vehicle perhaps. Absolutely, yeah. It was certainly uh, I was like, oh, whatever I do in the first four minutes of this open mic set, I'll at least end with a one minute song that uh, kind of works most of the time. And will most undoubtedly arouse oh, some applause. Certainly, which is I, one of the nice things about the music thing is. That, Oh it's yeah, a Pavlovian response. It, yeah, if you're even if you're just background music, like I would play at like a Barnes and Noble cafe once in a while, uh, the one at, at BU in uh, Kenmore that I. Oh yeah, you you play, nobody's listening, you stop. They're like, oh yeah, absolutely. That's wonderful. But no, when you're when you're entertaining a bar full or not entertaining a bar full, <laughs> when there's just a bar and people are drinking and there is com- background comedy, not as much. We'd love to have you just talk in the background. People don't need to listen at all. But when you finish a joke, they will, ah, ha, 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 you know. Just... <laughs> when did you finally, what was the, was there like a, a one point where you finally realized I'm putting the music down and I'm going to become a, a word guy? Uh, I mean, I definitely still play music for fun. Uh, the way that I think of it now is, you know, sort of comedy is my my wife, uh, but it's an open marriage, and ah. <laughs> uh, like I'm allowed to see music, and sometimes we have three ways, and you know, they, like there's comedy music, and everybody, nobody's jealous. Every like it's it's honestly, you know, I make my money from comedy, but I and I have fun doing comedy, and I have fun playing music, and you know, I've also, if I were given the opportunity, like I'm actually right now. Uh, I just finished a Kickstarter for a new music album that I'm ah. just going to do for fun because I do I play music, I record songs, I like doing it, uh, and I can. And, you know, so I, I saw if there was people interested in hearing it, then why not do it? And then everybody who wants it can have it. And if you don't want it, you don't have to have it. So explain uh, Kickstarter to maybe the uninitiated. Oh, uh, Kickstarter. Well, uh, welcome to, uh, I mean, I'm... Uh, you figured out how to work this screen, so uh, you're right on your way. Unless you're like, I'm trying to change it. I don't know how to do it. There are too many buttons. Um, Kickstarter is uh, just a website that allows you to go on and say, I want to make uh, a project of any kind of, like, any kind. It just has to be something. It can't be like, just give me money for, uh, for my lunch. You know, it has to be like, I'm going to make an album or a movie or a book uh, or a, I think certain kinds of businesses, you know. But for me, I've done it for... Uh, like artistic, you know, creative projects a couple times. And uh, it's just you say, here's what I want to do. Here's the money that I need. And uh, if you say, like, if you want the album, that normally would cost $10 eventually. Uh, then if you promise to give me $10, if I raise this amount of money, which was around, I asked for $1,800 uh, to, you know, hire 
uh, the specific people that I needed to record the music and then uh, take the pictures for the album covers, or like the most bare bones of what I need. And sort of it's very transparent, like people can see like, oh, that's why you're asking for this money, and if you get that money, then you can do it, and then you're sort of just accountable to like, I can't not do it because people are gi have given me uh, at the end of it, their money, uh, and... Uh, they have invested in you. Oh, yeah, certainly. So uh, I'll do the thing, and I'll give them uh, the end result. Right. And that is to be released sometime this year? Yeah, I think... Uh, Does my, it have a name? Uh, it doesn't have a, an exact name yet. The Kickstarter project, I called it just like a fun song, a fun song-filled music. I don't even remember what I called it, but uh, something about fun and music. Excellent. Uh, but uh, And it's not explicitly comedy, so I want to make... I've, I've done my best to make it clear to everyone. People don't read everything all the time or listen True. to everything. So it's like, oh, so how's this new comedy song thing coming? As well, it's not exactly. Uh, well, that's fine. Well, thank you. I'll, I think <laughs> I'll put the first song on the album. Will be like, this is not a song. This is not an album full of comedy songs. <laughs> uh, some of them might be, but uh, you know, otherwise, not all of them. Yeah, just to be clear. Pace yourself. Managing folks. expectations <laughs> is the name of the album. Uh, yeah, I'm a big fan of that. I'm always a big fan of setting the bar low. Nothing. Yeah, there and can be. No, do you know? Do you know the story of the Zen master and the broken goblet? I'm not sure if I do that. If you know that well, one. for anyone out there who doesn't know, which it could include anyone in here, in here, uh, there, I'm told that there is a, a Zen master who uh, was, I think, speaking to his students, and he's uh, washing a goblet, and he's saying, "This is my broken goblet," and it's not broken. Uh, it's at, at the time it looks like a regular, you know, just healthy, clean, like full fully formed goblet, and he says, I conceive of it as my broken goblet while I drink out of it, while I clean it, while I put it away, because one day I may drop it, and then I won't be upset because I'm like, oh, that was just my broken goblet. So if we conceive of ourselves and our careers and our, uh, our personal lives, our, our relationships, like everything will, you know, your body won't exist at some point, every, you know, every, every person's body, it seems so far, uh, will dissipate into nothingness. Nobody uh, has beaten those odds yet. No, and so every you know every job, every relationship. If you you know, so if you have expectations, if you're like, oh, I really, you can, it's fine to hope for things. But if you conceive of everything that you ever do or could do as a broken goblet, then once it once it does break or doesn't happen, then you're like, well, well, fine. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're certainly making my my uh, lifetime of diminished expectations for myself. You got it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> feel like an accomplishment. <laughs> you are achieving what I'm talking about. <laughs> So, you've had a really good comedy career for, for somebody who hasn't been... I mean, you've been in the business now, what, 13 years? Uh, yeah, th I, 13 is what I've been saying, but I realize at, at some point this year, I think I'll have to switch it to 14. 14, right. Yeah, so at 2002 to now it is 2016, so 14-ish years now. Yeah, so you've done quite a few things. You've done a last comic standing in 2010. I did. Give us a little bit of a, a, little bit of a refresher on how that experience was. Sure. Uh, well, that, it was... I'd been doing comedy, you know, like about eight years at the time, which, you know, I think they wanted, they, in the beginning of that show, they sort of wanted to present it like American Idol that, you know, hey, we might be discovering a great undiscovered talent, you know, because with American Idol, you could be singing alone in your basement, in your shower, and you could be amazing. You could have been singing your whole life, and uh, you don't have to, you know, be in front of people right. to get great at music. Uh, but with comedy, you kind of do. You so kind of do. For most of the people who would end up in sort of the top ten, or the finalists, uh, or even the semi-finalists, I think, on that show, I remember that, you know, you basically, they did hold open calls, you know, so you could stand in line. And they weren't, as far as I understand it, it wasn't fixed. It's just that the people who didn't stand in line, like there was always, you know, you know hundreds of people in a line, and then the next day they'd say, uh, hey, comedians who have, you know, agents or managers or, or just regular working comedians who know people at the club who could make a call to set up an appointment. Uh, so some people did that. So I went in, you know, I'd, I'd auditioned years in a few years earlier as well. Yeah. I'd stood in the open call lines, you know, I think the first year uh, that they did it, probably like 2003-ish, somewhere around then, at, at the comedy, the old comedy connection at Faneuil Hall. Oh, sure. And, uh, and so I don't remember exactly, I'm sure the same thing was happening then. You know, they had... You, they saw hundreds of people in each in every city they went to. They picked uh, probably you know fifty, you know somewhere between like forty and a hundred people to come back and do a few like showcases at night. Like I think right. the year that I finally did it, I got picked, and I came back that night, and there was like thirty three people on my show. You know everybody's doing like two minutes, uh, and then they had another one either the next night or the night before, 
and, uh, and then at the end of that one, they, from those 60-something people, uh, and then 60-something people in the version that they did in LA, right. they get that down to, I think, like 40-something semifinalists, and they flew us all out to LA, and then from that, they whittled it down. You know, every time we're just, for my round, it was just doing comedy. Every time, you just do a few minutes of comedy, and the judges who uh, my year were Andy Kindler, uh, <laughs> Natasha Legero, and uh, the late great Greg Giraldo. Oh wow! Uh, so I mean, it was it was an honor. They're you know people who know what they're doing and right. know what they've been doing and know talking about. And uh, I mean, since then, the years that they brought it back since my season in 2010, they even further have like they don't even have the open call anymore. They just say we're going to pick a hundred comedians and then get, go down from there to however many till we get to the top one. And you got to number five. Uh, yes, I was uh, number five out of all of the people in the competition. So that's quite an accomplishment. I mean, certainly. Uh, it's funny, I remember when Doug Benson, a uh, very funny yep. comedian I like, did it several years earlier, and I think he got knocked out around number six. Uh, and, uh, you know, you can't compare stats year to year. There's uh, differentials, and also everything is subjective. But Correct. Uh, I remember him making a big deal. He was like, uh, humorously, and, uh, uh, you know, sort of just playing into it, being like, I'm the sixth funniest person in the world. <laughs> uh, and so for me, now also, uh, sadly, uh, the person who came in fourth was Mike DiStefano. I mean, that part's not sad, but he also passed away. So right. technically now I'm number four. Uh, <laughs> I moved up, and I would be happier to have By my friends. attrition, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, he would love that joke if he were here. I'd love Indeed. him to be here more than have that joke. Uh, but it was, I mean, it was just a wonderful experience meeting, like, tons of people who I didn't know. Probably I knew about half of the semifinalists, like, some people from Boston, like Joe List was no, there. No, Joe's a great comic. I know, like Nikki Glazer was there, and she was a person who I knew a little bit, and like got to be friends with, you know, got to be friends with just like a ton of people, and then the top five especially, because we went on tour for like several months afterwards. But, but yeah, the, the basic shape of it is you audition, uh, you know, people judge you based on your appearance in an empty room, which is, uh, you know, perfect for comedy. Right. Uh, it's like, here are how jokes would go if there was an audience, so without energy or reaction or anything. And then they bring you back and you perform in front of audiences, like, multiple times over the course of, like, several months. And then by the end of it, it's, uh, you know, happening almost live. Like, I think we would fly out to L.A. on Saturday, tape it on Monday during the day. It would air Monday at night, <clears throat> find out the next week who moved on, and the cycle would continue. Uh, and it's still happening. I st I'm still doing it. They're not airing it anymore. But, uh... <laughs> so how do you... How... Much uh, of a change in the business has there been, uh, and, how, and how has it affected you, the, the whole social media, you know? Oh, like... sure. Uh, I mean, that moment, uh, like that, that season uh, of Last Comic Standing was the, the biggest shift, certainly up to that point in my career. Like, I'd been on one late night show uh, the year before. Yeah, which was? Uh, the Tonight Show with Conan. Oh, great. In that limited window where that yeah. existed, uh, so a valuable... Uh, rarity sure. of an experience. And did you, you also did David Letterman? Uh, yes, I, d I did Letterman afterwards a couple times between like 2011 and 2014, That's I great. think. And uh, yeah, I got to do a number after that. Uh, yeah, up to that point, I'd done one you know five minute thing on Comedy Central on Live at Gotham, uh, which was also I mean I'm great, all great opportunities uh, that I was grateful right. for, uh, and they you know helped me sort of you know get bookings and get attention from you know some. Like, I went to the Montreal Comedy Festival. And so I started, like, headlining a little bit, but I wasn't, you know, a draw or a name. People still didn't, they, you know, of the, I think there were probably four seasons of Live at Gotham and, like, ten seasons of uh, Premium Blend before that oh, right. with, you know, like, oh, dozens right. of comedians every season. So, you know, it's not like that credit necessarily alone makes you stand out to be like, well, then, come see this guy who you might have seen a little bit after <laughs> midnight one fine Friday in June 2008. Uh, but... Uh, so Last Comic Standing was a thing that, you know, millions of people watched every week. And so after, and that probably got me, I'd say, you know, more Facebook friends than I could have as friends. So I converted to a fan page. So then there started being, like, you know, uh, thousands and thousands of people, right. like, rolling in over the course of the next years that now, when I do go to perform, you know, in different towns, like, there are always people who come out and say, I first saw you on Last Comic Standing. So that yeah. was uh, definitely a nice... Uh, a nice launching pad for people knowing who I am. And now you have a Netflix special. I do. Uh, that was, uh, it came out in 2014, and but it is 
there, I hope always. I mean, I, I don't know. Uh, I'm sure they can take things down if they wish. But uh, uh, yeah, it's called Small, Dork, and Handsome. And it was, you know, so I, before that, I did a, a half hour special for Comedy Central, which also think came out in 2010, around when I was doing Last Comic Standing. And uh, that's, that was the only special I'd had prior to this. I'd put out a couple albums on my own uh, or with, you know, with some record labels. Uh, but this was the first time that, uh, you know, sort of, it seemed like, you know, there's, there's always different paths in sure. comedy. You know, like it, all, it used to be get on Johnny Carson, do right. your five minutes, and then you can tour the country. You can have a residency in Vegas maybe. You can, maybe you'll get a sitcom. And now, you know, there's so many different possible paths uh, that for me, in this situation, it was like, okay, so I got on TV doing five minutes, then a half hour, then I guess the next step is an hour if I can do that. And so, uh, I rec- you know, I recorded an album in 2012, and I recorded, like, much more than I needed and sort right. of edited that down, and we sort of submitted that uh, to different places to see, hey, will anybody uh, produce this as an hour special? And uh, at the time, the company that was called New Wave then, uh, that might be different now, but... Uh, they were like, yeah, we'll, ma- we'll make it. Well, here's, here's uh, some money for you and lots of money for other people. And <laughs> then hopefully we'll sell it to somebody and get some money back. And I hope that that's worked for them because uh, Netflix did buy it. And right. so that's uh, one of the major, you know, sort of advantages of living as a comedian in this time. I mean, anything, you know, you can put out an album and then it, people can hear it on, you know, Spotify or Pandora or on Sirius Radio or where. Like, it, it can be anywhere, everywhere, and, like, Netflix is there all the time. Like, my mom, you know, I think is probably the only person who still thinks of, uh, like, what day is that show on, you know? <laughs> like, when does that? Sure. And I'm like, it's on uh, all the time, forever, just uh, right. in, streamed into your brain directly. Right. Um, before I get to the New Hampshire trivia oh. question. Of course, of course. Uh, I would like to ask you perhaps some advice other than not getting into comedy at all. Oh, sure. What, what advice would you give to young people or old people or anybody that wants to become a comedian? Uh, I mean, first, you're a broken goblet. So definitely... That's a callback. Oh, yeah. Uh, do, anything, like, nobody is guaranteed anything in this or any business. I mean, sometimes people are afraid, like... When people talk to me, they're like, you know, people who have, say, like a 9 to 5 or like something that, they, you know, they have a 401k, they have an IRA, they have retirement accounts, they have, you know, job security. They know where their money will be coming from, theoretically, six months from now. While I, I might know, like, where one of my dollars is coming from <laughs> at that time. But, uh, Providing that club doesn't close. Exactly. You know, a, <laughs> but, but here's the thing is, you know, we've seen in the past at least 10 years or different times throughout history, but... Uh, Sometimes even the jobs that people think are secure, like, are no longer, you know. Like, my, my parents were both teachers, and my grandmother was a nurse. My grandmother worked at the same place 37 years. Right. And that is uh, not the common, al- that's not, not the norm today. Very rare. So even, you know, for people who've had jobs at, like, the big banks, uh, the, you know, like, big, like, Wall, Wall Street, like, the, the places where, you know, like, the job is money. Like, so certainly, there's always going to be money. Money's got to be a good job to get into. Like, but even then, like, those jobs fall away. Those companies, uh, you know, fall apart. Uh, right. So if even the most secure of job possibilities isn't secure, then why not follow a dream? You know, why not uh, try to do... Because it's also, like, it, take, it might take years and years to get good enough at comedy or whatever creative thing you want to do that you'll get paid at it. There's no guarantee. But also, like, if you want to become a doctor, you got to go to four years of college, uh, how how many years of med school, residencies, internships. Like, you're putting in how much money and time, like, at least, you know, 10 years and many dollars. Like, this way, (laughs) save that money, invest that in your, you know, your comedy internship. And then if by, this is the thing I saw Eugene Merman say once, he's like, you know, try to do it for 10 years. And if after 10 years it didn't work, then you can quit. But, right. but there's no, like, there's no reason. There's no guarantee, uh, like, especially because something as uh, subjective as comedy, like, people say that Louis C.K., when he started, was just, like, some super weird guy who no one thought was very funny. And, like, to hear him tell, like, stories about, you know, DJ Hazard helping him out because, like, I would help him with the room, and uh, so he'd give me some stage time, and I'm very grateful because... Right. Uh, I wasn't good, you know. <laughs> like, that's the thing is, I saw Richard Jenny say in an open mic documentary once, he's like, if you're, if you're just starting out, 
I mean, go watch this documentary. You see Richard Jenny say it, but I remember him saying, like, if you're starting out and you think that you suck and you feel like you suck and every audience seems like you suck and they're telling you that you suck, you're probably on the right track, you know? <laughs> so basically, just if you want to do something, uh, start doing it. Like, you know, look Look into who is doing it. See what they're saying. Like, people who you like, people who are succeeding at doing it. Every comedian that you might enjoy, I mean, every comedian who's succeeding uh, in some measure, whatever it might be, whether they're on TV or just touring, uh, not even just touring, if they're touring, you know, if they're doing comedy for a living or even not for a living, but they're creating art that you enjoy, listen to what they say about how they did it, and the answer is almost always going to be just... Uh, they did it. They just started doing it. Like, should I take a class? Should I read a book? You can. You don't have to. You can just go to, if you're in a town where there are shows to see, go to those shows. If there's a club, go to that club. If there's an open mic, find out how to get on it. Just, uh, I mean, the, the main answer is just to do it because you won't do it by not doing it. So we've reached the, uh, the, the point where I give you some New Hampshire trivia. Of course. And we'll see how, how started up you are. I, we'll start out New Hampshire trivia with Mike Kaplan. Which of these is not a town in New Hampshire? Okay. Permort, Lempster, Blue Ball, or Effingham? Now, Blue Ball and Effingham <laughs> sound so silly that I don't think you made them up. Those <laughs> must be real ones. So the other two are Permort and... Lempster. Lempster. Uh... I, Lempster also sounds like a silly real thing, so I'm going to say that Permort's not a town. Ah, good guess, but it is a town. Is it, it Lempster? Is a, it's a very tiny... Nope, it's not Lempster. Oh, it's... Is it Effingham? It, those are all three New Hampshire towns. So it's Blue Ball. Blue Ball oh. is a Pennsylvania town. You got... Oh, I, it is a town. Okay. I, I see is. what that... You tricked me. <laughs> I did. Uh, next. How long is the New Hampshire coastline? Uh, the New Hampshire coastline is 13 miles. Well, according to my stats, 18 miles. Now, uh, here's what I'm going to say. Okay. Is I did a show last night in Portsmouth, New, New Hampshire, Hampshire. Uh, during which there was a, a segment of, uh, of the show where I have a joke that talks about like different trivia facts, and I sort of get trivia facts from the audience. And somebody in Portsmouth definitely thinks it's 13 miles. <laughs> Which one of these famous people was not born in New Hampshire? Musician, performance artist, Gigi Allen. Mm. Christian science founder, Mary Baker Eddy. Mm. Singer, songwriter, Mandy Moore. Ooh. Actor, humanitarian, Leonard Nimoy. I'm going to say Leonard Nimoy. You are correct. All right. <laughs> Gigi Allen was born in Lancaster, Mary Becker Eddy, Bo, singer-songwriter Mandy Moore, Nashua, right here, and London and Moore was born in Boston. Uh-huh. I accept. What was the name of the 1981 film shot in New Hampshire and starring Henry Fonda, Catherine Hepburn, and Jane Fonda? Is it What About Bob? On Golden Pond? On Golden Blonde? Or Peyton Place? Now, I'm sure I'm being tricked again, but I'm going to say On Golden Pond. On Golden Pond is correct. And here's the geek bonus. Okay. In the original Star Wars film, Luke, Leah, Han, and Chewbacca get stuck in a trash compactor in the Death Star. Do you know what the number of that trash compactor was? Ooh. I am, I guess, sad slash glad <laughs> to say that I don't. <laughs> it was... Three two six three eight two seven. Oh, is that a phone number? And I, no, I don't know. I just for some reason that's one of the Star Wars chunks of trivia that was drilled into my head for having seen it so you many times. You got it. I first saw it here in Nashua. So, so it was a pleasure having you on the show. Uh, and you did uh, win the majority of the uh, questions. Well, so if you reach under uh, the uh, chair to your uh, there you go. There's a bag. Uh, oh, wow, that's you a wouldn't bogus. Have... Wouldn't have told Our me about this. Swag bag. Very nice. So you get uh, uh -huh. a zombie sub uh, sticker. Very nice. Yeah, that's a car comic book made in New Hampshire. Wonderful. And then that's, uh, oh, yeah, and that's great for the, the toast. Oh, sure. And that's also made in New I'm Hampshire. I'm a fan of cameras. cinnamon. There we go. So, Mike Kaplan, appreciate it. Thanks for coming on the Bogus Hour. Thank you. And I hope to have you on again sometime soon. Uh, same here.
Cheers. Much appreciated. Thank you.